in our biblical leadership series, and we've uh, this is I think the ninth message in that series. We're taking this summer as as the we have this Awana break, and a lot of our teachers are in here, a lot of our workers are in here. We kind of talk about biblical leadership, and tonight we're we're still talking about biblical leadership, but we're moving on to uh, giving some practical tips for teaching. Now, you say, well, I'm not a teacher. Well, that's a problem. We're all teachers in some shape, form, or fashion. And we want to be a teacher, whether it's uh, in a formal setting of a classroom, or whether it's in the home as the parent, or whether it's a peer, peer-to-peer. We want others to be, to be learning. And tonight, as we think about biblical leadership, our topic is, of course, biblical leadership imparts truth effectively. And we'll talk about Scripture, how we can impart truth effectively. And, of course, all the principles we're going to look at tonight are principles from Scripture. And uh, they're principles that can be used in the classroom setting. They can be used in the, the home setting. They can even be used in peer-to-peer. Uh, once again, don't think because you're not a formal teacher in a classroom teaching somewhere that these don't apply to you. Once again, we've over and over again dealt with the fact we're all leaders. We want to make sure we're biblical leaders. Uh, I remember years ago teaching in a school, and every year there were nominations for the National Honor Society. And part of that was surveys were given to the teachers. Here's somebody who's been nominated. You fill out the survey. One man had been nominated every year and never made it because one of the requirements was about leadership. Who's a great leader? In the wrong direction. He was a great leader, always in the middle of getting in trouble with somebody else. We want to make sure, yes, we are leaders, but we're biblical, godly leaders. In Second Timothy tonight, chapter two and verse two, dealing with this topic of teaching. Notice here in Second Timothy chapter two and verse two to deal with the concept of leadership and teaching. Notice what Paul tells Timothy here. He says. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Let's see three generations of teaching. There's Paul teaching Timothy, Timothy teaching those he's ministering to, so that they in turn could teach someone else. Within the fabric of our being, in society is the fact that we are teaching. We're teaching right or we're teaching wrong. We want to make sure we are good, godly teachers. So tonight, as you have your, your outline there, I want to, as quickly as possible tonight, go through ten tips, ten truths concerning teaching, imparting truth effectively to other individuals. And once again, depending on your situation, you kind of have to kind of figure out how to put it there, but it applies to all of us. The first one um, is found in Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter number 15, verse number 18, says this, A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Go back up to verse number 1 of that same chapter. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Point number one is this. It's all in your attitude. It's all in your attitude. In both verses, we see two different reactions. He says there's two reactions that you can have in any given situation. It all boils down to attitude. Attitude. Within the teaching setting, whether it's in the, in the, whether it's in the living room or the classroom, Attitude makes a lot of difference. Now, if we're not careful, what happens is this. We become a a number one critic, and we can see something happening that's wrong 400 yards away, but never pray something happening up here that's good. It's all an attitude. How do we respond to things? I've known many teachers through the years, and every teacher has their own personality, own way to deal with things in the classroom. It's amazing to me through the years how much I learned about positive reinforcement. If you praise this over here, those that seek your attention generally try to follow suit. Now, there are some that do not. They have to learn the hard way. But it's amazing how keeping things positive 
changes the environment. Notice letter A there from Proverbs 16 and verse 21. It says this, The sweetness of the lips increases learning. The sweetness of the lips increases learning. How are you going to react to situations, whether it's parenting, grandparenting, Sunday school, Awana, the sweetness of the lips increases learning. Let's check our attitude when we're teaching, when we're in that situation. I understand, been there, done that, you have a bad day. What's your number one reaction? It's usually not sweetness of the lips, is it? Okay? But notice this biblical principle about our attitude in teaching. Notice, Scripture teaches this. We're kind of summarizing it. Letter B. The tongue is a little member. Remember that? That's James. It's a very small member of the body. But with that little member, it can be used either two ways. To cause great fires of destruction, or it can bring life-saving encouragement. How do we use it? The way we use our tongue usually depends on our attitude. Our attitude. So tip number one in teaching, imparting truth to other individuals, it's all about attitude. Where is our attitude? Number two, second principle, Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 4. Proverbs 24, verse 4. And by knowledge so the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Notice this. Inspiration often precedes education. Inspiration. Inspiration often precedes education. Think back to when you were in school. What was your, who was your favorite teacher? Turning your book to 21. Today we're going to study the American Revolution. The American Revolution took place in... Did you enjoy that teacher? Nerd. Most of all, most, we didn't usually enjoy that kind of teacher, did we? But you get a teacher who, of all things, really enjoys history, and they make history come alive for you. Oh, man, can you imagine? This happened, this happened, and they're all, all energetic. They were inspiring. They got you interested in... It was more than just a book sitting on your desk. They inspired you to learn more. They inspired you. I mean, you're looking at the history book and going, Man, where's he getting that stuff from? It inspired you to learn more. Inspiration often precedes education. Notice this quote from Mark Rasmussen. He says, For the engine of learning to begin to turn, there must be a fire built in the furnace of inspiration. Great truth there. When teaching, we must inspire. So, you know, what does that mean? That means there's going to be days... As you come into Sunday school and you feel like you've been hit by a Mack truck, but you still have to come in and inspire. You are teaching the truth of God's Word, right? You come into Obana, and you can already tell, man, it's going to be a doozy of a night because as soon as Miss Ronnie dropped them kids off, man, they were wired. You know what you got to do? you got to take that energy and change it to inspiration so that catching what you're teaching. It has to be that inspiration. Notice this, letter B. If the student, whether that's a student in the classroom, whether it's a, a child at home, if the student concludes that the principles taught are not important to the teacher, he certainly will place no value on them. Does that make sense? So if I'm getting up and, I mean... If I get up on Sunday mornings and I preach, you know, well, the Lord's good. I think we all know that. And, um, he, he's holy too. And um, w would you get the impression it, that really isn't important to me? Would it inspire you to take it seriously? No. See, the teacher has to communicate that truth. It has to be communicated to that student, this is important to me. This is, this is truth that I'm imparting to you. This is, this is valuable. 
if the student understands it's valuable to the teacher, they're more likely to place a value in it themselves. Number three. Number three. Maximum involvement equals maximum learning. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 14. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge. Notice, the heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge. But the mouth of fools speedeth on foolishness. Maximum involvement. If an individual is going to learn, they have to be involved in the learning process. Notice that right there. student must be involved in the learning process. Being involved in the learning process is not sitting in the seat. How many of you went to school and you sat in a seat but were not involved in the learning process? You were in the classroom, but were you learning? So the individual has to be in the learning process, involve them in the learning process. How does that take place? Well, as a teacher, you have to know personalities. And, and it's going to be, you know, part of involving them is going to be, you know, telling that story in a way that's interesting. Oh, man, you should have seen David. Could you imagine David coming into the camp and seeing that giant down there? Oh, man, you know, he wasn't much older than you guys. You know, see, you draw them out of their seats. You captivate their interest. Maximum involvement. It could be in Sunday school class or at home or whatever. They're involved in the process because of a, a game, an activity. You know, every so often having maybe a review game in class. It involves them in the process. If, in order for them to learn, they're going to be involved in the process. You know, when I was thinking about this principle, I thought about grandparents. I said, really? Yeah. Really. I mean, think about it. When you were a parent and you had your 25 kids, you didn't have that many, it was close, but or you know you had a three, four, five, and you're trying to trying to be a parent and 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 work a forty hour job and do other things you needed to do. There's a lot of things maybe you wanted to do with the child but didn't have time to. But then you send them off to the grandparents who theoretically have been, have retired, they're not working, and they all this time and they are now investing, getting involved, getting the child involved in doing something that you as a parent wish you had time to do. I mean, didn't we love going to grandparents? I did. I loved going up to the grandparents because they had all this time. They were interested in me. Not that my parents were, but they were able to invest in me in ways that my parents did not. You see, maximum involvement equals maximum learning. I always can probably testify of things that our grandparents taught us that our parents didn't because they had the opportunity to invest in us, and it gets involved. Notice, here's a, another quote. It says, drawing the student out of the comfort zone ought to be the primary goal of every instructor. What's the comfort zone? The comfort zone is sitting in their chair, twiddling their thumbs. That's the comfort zone. As a teacher, we want to draw them out of that. Get them excited about what's being taught. Get them excited about the truth. Not just a Bible story that we're telling, but the truth in that story. Draw them out of that comfort zone to be, so they can participate in the learning process because letter B, as you see there, concentration will not occur if the students are not involved in the educational process. What do you mean? Here's the kid sitting in your class. Miss Ronnie brought him in on the bus. He stayed up late last night because his parents didn't make him go to bed. He went to bed at 1 o'clock. Got up at 8 o'clock or whatever. He's cranky. He's tired. And as a teacher, you didn't do much better. You went to bed late too, so you're getting you're in a book. And David went into the camp and he saw Goliath and heard him. What's that child doing? He's not involved in the education process, is, is he? He's in the classroom, but is he involved? Is he concentrating on what's going on? Absolutely not. Concentration would never occur if the students are not involved in the educational process. Whether that's in a game or whether it's you captured their mind and they are now, as you're telling the story, they're imagining it happening in their minds. See, 
Now they're involved in the process. Number four, moving quickly here, number four. The biggest room in a life is the room for improvement. The biggest room in a life is the room for improvement. Very familiar verse. I'll turn over there. I'll read it to you. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Philippians 3, verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Notice, I press forward. There's always room for improvement. You have not finished the race yet. I haven't either. We're always moving forward. There's always room for improvement. Notice this, letter A. The student and the teacher must understand that there is always room for growth and improvement. And once again, don't get lost and think, well, I'm not a teacher. You could put parent there. You could put the child and the parent. The child and the grandparent. Okay? Always understand there's always room for growth and improvement. Those who truly understand the heart of the Lord, those who understand the mind of Christ, realize the necessity for us continually growing and learning. Even in our series this year, our theme this year, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, continually growing. This growth goes beyond simply the boundaries of a classroom. It goes beyond the boundaries of a house. It goes into the constant building, investing in that individual so that it goes beyond the academic into building skills and character. That's what our goal is, isn't it? To develop new skills and to develop character in those individuals we're trying to invest in. There should be a change of character as we are teaching. Notice letter B. Potential is a word often overused but seldom realized. Oh, they've got a lot of potential. And we use that word a lot, don't we? But how many of us invest or see people actually reach their potential? As leaders, we want to see people reach their potential. Whether it's as a boss on the job, Sunday school teacher, a wine leader, a pastor, a parent, a grandparent. We want to see those individuals reach their potential. Number five. Number five. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Once again, another familiar verse. Many of you probably could quote it. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Notice, number 5. Choose right over what is easy. Choose right over what is easy. Notice that verse. Presenting your bodies a living sacrifice. Choose what is right over what is easy. If we're investing in young people, investing in others, understand the idea of investing is sacrifice. Do what is right, not just what is easy. Is it... Let me ask you this. Would it be right for me on Sunday e or Saturday evening about 8 o'clock to go Google a sermon for Sunday morning? Oh, there's plenty of them out there, I can tell you. It'd be easy, wouldn't it? I can print off a three-point sermon right here, sermon with, oh, illustrations and everything. Would you, would you expect more out of me than that? That would be easy, but would, would it be right? No, you expect me, as the pastor of this church, to be spending time in the Word of God each and every week, praying and bringing the message God would have me to bring, not just Googling it. Make sense? Okay. Do we choose what is right or what is easy in other areas of life? 
No. If the preacher isn't going to supposed to bring a Saturday night special, what about the Sunday school teacher? What about the Awana leader? What about parents? You know, parenting is not easy when it's done right. Choose what is right, not where it's easy. Notice letter A. Dividends. Everybody know what dividends are? Okay. Dividends require investment. If you didn't invest in Microsoft, are they giving you any dividends? No. Dividends require investments. Investments, on the other, t- on the other hand, require sacrifice. If I'm investing in someone else, teaching someone else, helping them build character, it requires investment. And investment is going to require sacrifice. Choosing what is right over what is easy is always a difficult choice. It's always a difficult choice. Because easy is easy. Right is often hard because it requires more of us. You know, you're flipping through your Sunday school book or, or your Awana book, and you know, you're looking, oh man, that would be a great activity. Oh, I don't feel like doing it though. It requires investment, doesn't it? If you wait till Saturday night and the activity requires you to have, you know, yarn and, and cups and all that kind of stuff, and it's 8 o'clock at night, oh man, I've got to run to Walmart and do that? No, uh, I'm not going to do it. Choose what is right over what is easy. Number six, ordinary people must have extraordinary dedication. Jude. Verse 22. Jude 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And some having compassion, making a difference. Ordinary people must have extraordinary dedication. I believe it was Thomas Edison that said something to the effect of um, there's 1% innovation, 90%, 99% perspiration from that statement. Letter A there is 99% perspiration. 99% perspiration. You know, we don't, the majority of us don't have the genius of Einstein. We don't have the creativity of Edison. I'll admit it, I don't. I'm not a genius. I'm not always creative. You know, but understand what we do have is an opportunity to dedicate ourselves to the life-changing work of being an emissary for Jesus Christ. And that young person, and that son, that daughter, that grandson, that granddaughter, that friend, that employee, we have that privilege, that opportunity to dedicate ourselves to the life-changing work of what God's called us to do for them. You see, if we're going to teach, um, if we're going to teach in ways that touch lives and leave a lasting imprint forever, then we're going to have to do this. We have to go the extra mile. We have to go the extra mile. It's that 99% perspiration. Once again, that investment. Notice number seven. Children are a precious treasure. Children are a precious treasure. In 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You remember the story here? Where is Samuel? Remember where Samuel at? He's at Jesse's house. He's looking over all the boys, isn't he? He thinks it's all the boys. Who wasn't there? Who was unnoticed? David. Scrawny, ruddy David. He wasn't there. Wasn't important enough that they thought to call him. But remember, children are a precious treasure. No one else saw it in David, but God saw it. 
Notice, teachers, you can put parents, you can put adults, you can put whatever, I mean, whatever leadership position you have there. Teachers have a tremendous impact. Those of you that work on the bus route, you have a tremendous impact. Well, they do all the visiting. I just drive the bus. I just drive the van. If you didn't drive it, who would? You know, kids notice that. That you took time out of your morning to come pick them up. Oh, but you know, Miss Ronnie does the visiting and Miss Rose, she does this. And you know, I just I just sing with song, sing the songs with them on the way to church. You're having a tremendous impact. You're investing in them. They understand you took time out of your day and you're investing in them. You're showing interest in them. Listen, you have a tremendous impact. Notice this, letter B. Never underestimate the value of a life and the impact you have on that child's life. You never know. You may be teaching, you may be singing with, you may be talking with, investing in the next David. Someone that nobody else notices, somebody else maybe no one else cares about, but God's looking on the heart. And God knows that's another David. He's going to grow up to be a man after my own heart. Never underestimate the value of a life and the impact you have on that child's life. Number eight. Number eight. Teaching equals training. Teaching equals training. We'll look at three passages here. Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Acts 20, 24 says this, But none of these things move me, neither count on my life, dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. In 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Notice the training is taking place. And then in Proverbs 22 and verse 6, in a very familiar verse, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he would not depart from it. Notice, teaching equals training. Well, what is training would be the next question. Here's another quote by Brother Rasmussen. Training involves a process whereby new skills are learned and a character change is affected. Training. I said it before. It's a couple of weeks ago. You know, if a parent, our response is, well, he doesn't know better. That's not an excuse. It's shame on us. It's an admission, I did not train them better. Training. Now, understand, sometimes, you know, as parents, the situation comes up, yeah, they didn't know better because I didn't think about t- the situation. But I can guarantee it won't happen next time. Because this is something that needs to change. I want to train them better. I am looking to affect a character trait and I'm going to look in developing a new skill within that individual. That is training. Teaching is more than just discussing a subject in which the teacher is an expert. You would expect the teacher to be somewhat qualified, wouldn't you, in that particular area? Teaching is more than just discussing the topic. It actually involves training that individual to also become an expert. When a child leaves your classroom, when a child leaves your home, don't you want them to be an expert as well, as much as possible? I mean, when that child turns 18 and he walks out the door to go to college or something, don't you want to have invested as much as you can in him so that when he walks out the door, he has at least an inkling of what to do? He has some character, some fortitude to stand up and do what's right. That's training. 
life skills, and character change. Number nine. Number nine. A good plan done is better than a great plan dreamed. It's a typo there in your, in your notes there. A good plan done is better than a great plan dreamed. Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 9. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is abomination to fools to depart from evil. Um, Psalm 31, verse 23. Psalm 31, verse 23. I love the Lord, all you his saints. For the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer, not dreamer. The proud doer. James chapter 1, verse 22. Once again, it amounts us not to be hearers of the word only, but to be what? Doers. And we hear a lot today about you know, inspiring kids to dream big. So, there's something we forgot. Dreams don't get you anything. We tell them to dream big, but tell them, don't have, give them an inkling of how to accomplish anything. Notice here, a good plan done is better than a great plan dreamed. Yes, encourage great dreams, but... Teach execution and completion of plans. It's okay to dream big. But all, if all you ever do is dream, guess what? You're going to be hungry. Dreams don't feed people. Dreams don't inspire people. It's when people accomplish their dreams that inspire others. We need to teach our young people how to execute a plan and accomplish the dreams they have. People, no, Rasmussen said this as well. People are not remembered for their great ideas or intentions. They are remembered by how they start and how they finish. It is imperative that they learn how to finish the job. We must teach them to finish. With us on the next, next quote there. You know, a school teacher said this. She said, you know, 100 years from now, it will not matter what my bank account was, the sort of house I lived in, or what kind of car I drove. But the world may be different because I was important in the life of a child. Listen, a good plan done is better than a great plan dreamed. Because the great plan was never accomplished, was it? But the good plan was. Then number 10. Number 10. You can only lead in the direction you are going. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, how could Jesus say something like that? What was the direction he was going? He was going to literally pick up a cross, wasn't he? And die for our sins. That's how he could say, take up your cross and follow me. You can only lead under the direction that you are going. Notice, letter A, students must be mentored and truths must be modeled. Parents, don't do this and you do this, which speaks louder, your words or your actions, your actions. Many times we fall into the trap of thinking, oh, well, I told them. Telling isn't teaching. Teaching is training. I must model the truths. As the leaders, whether it's behind this pulpit, whether it's in a, a lecture back in a classroom, whether it's behind the desk at work, 
whether it's in the kitchen, over the kids, whatever position you're in, understand this. You can only lead in the direction you're going. As a leader, you are held to higher standards. That's why in the church, those in leadership are held to higher standards. I can't say, do this, and open the door over here. Oh, I didn't, I didn't do a lot of that. No, but you're a leader, and if you don't do a lot, you still have sanction, that, and people will follow you, and they'll go further down the road than you did. That's why it's imperative to make sure we are on the right direction. You can only lead in the direction you are going. Let us letter B. It is much easier for someone to reach the goal if we lead them there. If we lead them there. You ever ask somebody for directions? And ten minutes later you're wishing, man, I wish somebody would just take me. It's a lot easier to get in the car and ride with someone that has been there before. As leaders, if those under us, God has, those that God has enabled us to invest in, if they are going to succeed in life, the best way for them to succeed is for us to lead them there. We cannot lead them where we have never been. We can't say, take that road, and we go down that road. The only place they're going to arrive at is the direction and the place that I'm going. Because if they follow me, what's going to happen? They're going to go down the same road I'm going down. And they may progress further down the road than, than we did. Make sure it's the right road we're going down, not the wrong road. Listen, there's just 10 tips tonight. But if we begin to apply them, it can radically change how we invest in others. We must be mindful of the privilege God has given us. He has called us to be in leadership positions. Don't take that for granted. Don't take the individuals God has placed under you, whether it's a Sunday school class, whether it's uh, employees at work, don't take that for granted. He's put you in that position to invest in those individuals. Never underestimate the, the value of that life and the impact that you may have on it. Make sure you're traveling in the right direction. Let's pray tonight. Father, we come to you thanking you for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your precious word. And Lord, I pray tonight as we have looked at these, Lord, these tips on how to teach truth effectively to those around us. Lord, that we would be mindful of the great privilege that we have of being in our leadership position. Lord, we are simply stewards of what you have given us. Help us to be good stewards. Lord, we never know who the next David that may come through our classroom, or the next David that may move in next door. Lord, we ne never know how, Lord, you may call us to impact that life. Or I pray that we would be mindful. Or that we would communicate truth effectively. And be mindful of your spirit. Help us to lead in the right direction. Lord, we love you tonight. Give you praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name we ask it.